sprouting possibilities when they leave. Do you want me to be more vague? Yeah. Yep. And you can use some of the abouts or the addressings to link to the four. You know, so you could say, let's say people noticed, I don't know, in that one, what well, we're addressing a whole bunch of different relationships. The ability to turn. <laughs> well, there's because there's a few. There's not just one one thing. There. There's quite a few. Turn. Yep. Yep. So it, there is an element of turning in that lesson, as well as. Is that something that's useful for them to, to feel though? Well, yes, that's that. Yeah, you, that's a tactic. So when you feel that your head can turn relative to your chest, so then you could say, notice that when you've forgotten your keys. Yeah. Yeah. Stability. So I can't hear too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just just as bored that you've got more of a sense of stability. One leg, other leg. On one leg. On, you know, yep. that you are actually, you have the capacity to be stable Yep. on one leg. And so the functions, I mean, I gave you some yesterday about standing on one leg, like getting into the bath. You need to be on one leg and stable. It's quite a precarious thing. What other situations do you need to be stable on one leg? Yep. yep. And uh, also noticing that you were balancing um, in a variety of body poses with your upper body doing different things. So you were still able to balance and still, um, you know, be functional with your upper body. Yeah. So there's a whole thing. We'll talk, um, Jenny's just setting up a presentation. We're talking about, um, I think it's in this one. I didn't go through the whole slides. These sort of the, the attributes of tasks where we're all constantly balancing mobility with stability. So in order to be very mobile, sometimes we need to be quite, well, in order to be very dexterous, actually, we need to be very stable. So you can't run and write at the same time because running is an inherently mobile task and, and writing is a highly dexterous task. So those two things don't go together. So high level of stability with a high level of dexterity is needed. Like to be highly dexterous, you need to be highly stable. Does that make sense? So... and. The, you know, this is, this is a really basic thing where, you know, there was one when we were, we used to do a lot of studies with kids who are clumsy, so developmental coordination disorder. And um, there was one technique that works a treat actually helps kids handwriting, some kids, is you put a weighted vest on them and it helps their handwriting. I mean, there's a lot of weighted stuff that's happening with kids with autism and stuff just to get them yeah, focused and ADHD right. kids and stuff like that to just simply quiet and quiets their nervous system down as well. And it means they don't have to think about being stable because they're so, they're so jiggly that this is taking all their attention. So writing is just, you know, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why that works is to impose stability on people. What we're doing here is finding stability and then the mobility within the stability, which is another thing again. So that being stable is not being stuck like that. Because, you know, I t say to my clients all the time, broomsticks aren't actually that stable. And your, your balancing strategy is to be a broomstick. So this is doing variations where you are introducing mobility within the system on top of a stable base. But that's actually a, quite an unstable base because it's only one foot. So it's a, they're dastardly lessons, aren't they? Getting on a bike. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yep. They might not notice they've got more energy because they're breathing. But uh, they notice how they're breathing when they're moving. Might be a breathing that there's, they might feel free, easier to breathe in standing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, a confidence level. Confidence when, level. When yep. you're playing around on the outside of balance. Yes. And adding additional uh, 
uh, upper torso weight to that and turning to destabilize, but yet with a yeah. sense of as much as it's unstable, but still with a sense of security because your foot's planted and you know that you can stop. But playing around with the outside of that must be quite for somebody that's yeah. unstable. Yep. Could you have some, some good rewards. Yeah, and, and that can go meta. So there's that ab absolute, like that physical thing about exploring your limits. But then there's that meta thing about exploring your limits. Yes, so that kind of risk-taking stuff, I was dealing with some emails this morning where they're looking to set up some simulations around for people if, the, if you're a risk-taker or not. So that kind of meta thing of how do, you, how do you explore what your limits are in any behaviour? Are you a risk taker or not? How do you keep safe and take risks at the same time? You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you could paste them into that kind of notice, notice what your relationship is to taking risks, to going to the limits. Do you go straight to the limit and muck around there because that's what you like? It's a bit of an adrenaline rush. Or do you approach it slowly and just sneak out your limits, something like that? So it gets big, doesn't it? Now, you don't want to give all of these things to your class because they'll go mental. You just want to chuck the box to Alison. Now, how did, how did, okay, yeah, sorry, you answer. Oh, no, it was just really um, building on what uh, Kevin was just saying. I was interested in, particularly when we had to have our arms out and then turn our heads. It's just in terms of that risk or confidence or whatever, the fact that your head could still be doing something when you're, unbalanced is can be very important because otherwise I presume you you know freeze yeah freeze. Mm. yep you watch people falling and they'll freeze their eyes freeze everything mm -hmm. whereas people who have trained to fall you know tumblers and gymnasts and stuff rugby players etc then they're completely free mm. you know mm -hmm. that can be tracking the ball and catching it and falling and doing everything else so there, there's this amazing sort of multitasking thing happening mm. as they're falling and then going into a tumble, mm. not taking their eyes off the ball. You know, cricketers in, you know, whatever, mm. doing the diving catch. Yeah. Great. Okay, was it okay teaching? Yeah. And what about watching? What did you... You see, it's a, it's a fantastic thing to watch, isn't it? Mm. Isn't it interesting, or am I just projecting my own interest on you? If you say it's boring as batshit, that's fine. No. But Kevin and I had the experience that it was interesting to, to have to teach it without having done it. Yeah. So, so it's it's the set of instructions you could well not instructions yeah. but the things you might offer up. Yeah. I I different I think because you're just imagining what that move might feel like rather yep. than having experienced what that move might feel like and yep. yeah really good point isn't it and partly yeah. uh, I think we we flogged our poor class a little bit hard because you don't know how tough it feels to be out there and unless you've yeah. done it yourself so yeah you don't know how demanding it is yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the, set, the people who taught second had an advantage in that sense. They didn't have me explaining the instructions, but they didn't need to because you had done it. You'd embodied it. So um, Linda and I were chatting just after the first thing when you looked at each other during the, the first part of the lesson. And some of the, um, some of the landmarks for learning stuff about what does an embodied learner look like, which I was kind of directing. So you're starting to build up a bit of a... Uh, what to look for when people are engaged or not. Mm, yeah. You know, are they doing it by rote? Can you tell when someone's, you know, doing the movement and they're doing their shopping list, their attention's in their shopping list versus are they really learning? Are they experimenting? You know, are they making mistakes? Are they going to the li limits of their stability? Are they having a little tumble? Are they, are they trying different variations or they're simply doing the same thing over and over again, you know, there's a really obvious thing. Winking out and lying down on the floor is another really obvious thing. The disposition of an empowered learner. So, yeah, what does that mean? Are you starting to see what that means? That this, what is the, you know, what, what are the characteristics of disposition? It's all of those things. You know, even you can, and you, some of it is holding their breath. 
it's not a not a purpose not a not a useful disposition but at least it tells you that they're engaged maybe too engaged and they need to disengage a little bit or the frown or the something you notice all of that and then you can deal with it you know can deal with the frown or um so forth all right good job nothing else that's good all right let's um let's continue on with a bit of uh theory yeah you do have a question doing the lesson and it was to do because you were talking about breathing and how it has it's one of those amazing rhythms which you can do consciously and if the driver doesn't want to do it it's just going to take the unconscious as well and what is, I was wondering, what was it that, because when you encounter struggle, it seems to be a general habit that most people take is to hold the breath or when you're concentrating a lot or you're learning a new task yeah. and you encounter a, a, a challenge of yeah. proportion. And why, why is it that the unconscious just doesn't go whoosh in this, in this? It will eventually. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But this question is my $64 million question. It is so universal that when we're struggling, we hold our breath. Mm. It's, why do we do it? It's so stupid. Yeah. It's one of the most counterproductive things. Now, sometimes it's, we think if we stiffen our trunk, we'll have more power because we can push through this stiff trunk. I kind of get that. But in these situations of danger, it's so counterintuitive. And, of course, we can't hold our breath forever. The autonomic system will kick in and say, like, really? Conscious? You're stupid. Breathe. Mm. And we'll have to. But this, you, you'll see it with all your students all the time. And why? It's just this, like from an evolutionary point of view, it, I, it just doesn't make sense. No. It, no. And I don't have an answer for you. Because yeah. it's like, why do we do it? Why, almost all of us do it. And it's the stiffening is the only thing that kind of makes sense. It doesn't, from our point of view, from a Feldenkrais point of view, it doesn't make sense because we want to be able to access the muscles that we're using to hold our breath we actually want to access to, to generate power. So biomechanically, it doesn't make sense anyway. And so, it's, an, um, it's just an enigma to me. Yeah. And do you think it's possible to, tr like, through con this conscious attention training, that our unconscious system or that background system starts getting yeah. changing too and that is yeah. possible? I think I... I believe it is possible. And martial artists tell us that it is possible because they train to not do it don't they? They train to not hold their breath. Mm. I think people in yoga train to not hold their breath. Don't mm. use yoga. Yeah. So there's a lot of traditions that actively train people to not hold their breath. And so it is, and I, so I believe it's possible, but if you really frighten somebody, <laughs> mm. that shock thing, they'll hold their breath. Yeah. However, the, you know, there's all these traditions where, where you don't. So, mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. And to bring people's attention to it time and time again, mm. um, you, you, will, you will always have to bring people's attention to it time and time again. Mm. Yeah. That's, yeah, mm. it's amazing. We are very funny. Mm. I wonder if it would even it be there, you know, if, if, the, if the breathing yeah. was correct. I don't, I don't know, like it was fluid. Yeah, I don't know, with the holding the breath. I, I used to watch my son when he was very, when, I, when he was a little baby and I'd take him out in the wind. The, when he'd hear the wind, he'd go, <gasps> and hold his breath. And then he learnt to not do it. So there's some, you know, that you, you hold your breath in. Yeah. 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 Don't know. I don't know whether it's some weird thing like, you know, those goats that freeze and then they fall over. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, They're but, so funny. But can, can you think about when uh, stop breathing can be beneficial for, for us, uh, be an advantage? When? Oh, I can't think of any, let's, any let's time. Let's think about it. Okay. Yeah. Because it's, it's happened... It's yeah, that's the, the goats they do. They play dead. Yeah. Yes, it's happened. It's the only when, thing I can think of when you have a shock, right? Yeah. And when we see the, you know, the enemy, or if we see a big tiger, 
what we will do. We we will, yeah. But why? It's not helpful. Oh, it's helpful. It's not helpful. If, if, if I'm, I'm not here, I'm not breathing, I'm yeah. dead, uh, right? Yeah. Probably he will pass yeah. me. <laughs> it must be yeah. some kind of freeze response. But you'd have to, you'd have to say it's not helpful to not breathe. You know, uh, it, even to be, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's, it's, it still actually doesn't make sense because you can be quiet and still. But breathe like I mean tigers and lions when they're really still stalking they still breathe do they have to? No, no. I so I understand. I no. I understand. No, I understand what you're saying. They're not shocked. I understand that. But what I'm saying is it's not helpful in the shock state to not breathe. It is actually not helpful. You're not getting oxygen. Yes, but we are not moving. Yes, we are breathing, we are moving and tiny bit. Yeah. yeah, 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 but it's a very dumb still. Okay, all right, it's slightly persuading me. Yeah. 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 Maybe. You know, you can see I'm 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 very well wedded to the idea that we need oxygen. Wait, does it? Does it? Very, very, very wedded to this idea. So I, you know, you persuaded me that there's a vaguely evolutionary thing to it. I, We're not in I, shock. I, I want to use it first. I'm just I haven't used it yet. I'm waiting. Okay. Um, it's kind of like well, who really? I mean, you could debate the why for our whole life. It's more the fact yeah. we can change it because, yes. like you said, is. Yes. I mean, even now, after doing this practice now, I'm so, I mean, I'm always, I've always been interested and attentive to the breath, but yeah. I know I'm likely when something new comes along and if I'm over-focusing or efforting, I'm likely yeah. to hold my breath. So I, I'm con like monitoring that a lot. Yeah. And I, I just naturally do things slower so I can breathe. Like I breathe, hold Perfect. my breath a lot less than I used to. Great. I mean, it's completely trainable because yes. there's all these different yes. traditions that yeah. do it. Yeah. But yeah. we have to train it. see train it. Yeah. That's right. Yep. So I think that's the bottom line. Um, I do want to move on though. So and if you've got something else important, is it really? Well, I'm, that's a horrible thing to say. Is it really important, Jane? Okay, good. All right. We'll be. Okay. Oh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> okay. That was it. Fantastic. Okay. I would never, I was one of those clumsy kids, so I'm so impressed with myself now. We are all <laughs> impressed too. <laughs> okay. Look, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but if you are in a fight flight mode and you have that holding of your breath, does that initiate all that cortisol and stress hormones, which... No. That needs that, oh. Holding the breath doesn't, it is, holding the breath actually isn't part of the fight flight thing. Oh, I thought I had something wise yeah. to say. No, but okay. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. Forget no, that. it's a good. It's actually a very good question because I had to stop and think about it. And I literally, I don't know if you noticed, I literally went into my file for all the dot points about the physiological things in in fight or flight, and respiration is more likely to increase uh, because right. you need more anyway, oxygen to the brain. Back yeah. to task. Yeah. Thank you. That was no. It was worth. That was worthwhile. I'll turn it off. <laughs>